Hi, Matt. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm okay. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. We're on uh, meaningoflife.tv, sister site of bloggingheads.tv, on which you've been many times. And you are Matt Iglesias, famous journalist. Is that the way you describe yourself? Always. Uh Uh-huh. And it works, right? It does. It does. People say, oh, yeah, I I must know you. Sure, sure. I know you. I know your work. I love you. (laughs) Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Uh, Actually, I'm an executive editor of Vox.com. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's less impressive, but congratulations anyway. Yeah, thank you. I'm trying. Uh, and before that, you were at Slate, you were at The Atlantic, you know, you burst on the scene as an enfant terrible, I don't know, some time ago, and now you're not an enfant anymore, no. so I guess you're just oh, terrible. I, I have a baby. I know. So many things have happened since you first showed up on Blogging Heads TV. You got yeah. married and you had a baby in that order, I think. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and that's great because we're going to talk about the meaning of life, specifically the meaning of your life. And a lot of people with kids, they somehow see their kids as, as figuring in to the meaning of their lives. But I don't want to lead the witness here. So let me just back up <laughs> and, without, and, and without making any references to offspring, ask you, Matt Iglesias, what gives your life meaning? Well, you know, it, it is definitely true that when you have a child, at least when I had my child, you find that that gives a, a, a lot of meaning to your life. I mean, it's obviously, it's a, it's a lot of time and a lot of work, as I think that people know. Um, but it does, even beyond the time that I spend uh, with, with, with my son and, and, and actually taking care of him, I do feel that sort of all aspects of, of my life, at least six months into it, are sort of suffused by the fact that, you know, my wife and I are working on this kind of like big project that involves a, a tiny helpless human being uh, who's going to be, you know, in our in our care for a long time. Um, I'm enough of a sort of a you know, a, a cold-blooded rationalist that I'm aware that this feeling of mine is like the product of millions of years of, of evolution and sort of instinct that, uh, you know, I am the surviving descendant of a long line of people who, for whatever reason, bothered to take care of their children. Uh, and I'm sort of following that instinct blindly rather than probably there being a, a really objective rational basis for it uh but it is very genuinely how i feel about things and that and the knowledge of of where this feeling springs from does not diminish it i take it or does it no i mean i don't really think that it does i think that's one of the interesting sort of things about life you know at a a certain point i began to feel like uh, I, i would like to have a kid and uh you know we did it and then then the baby is born and it's like i really love him and i'm I'm well aware, sort of scientifically speaking, of how that comes about, uh, but it doesn't make it any less real. So the fact that this is just your genes' ways of making copies of themselves, that does that's not taking the fun out of it for you. Yeah, and I, I do think that sometimes that's the wrong way to think about science, you know. So, like, there's a table in front of me, and, and my laptop is sitting on the table, and, and I know that according to, like, physics and chemistry, what appears to be a solid object, there's, in fact, a lot of empty space in it. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could throw the word just around a lot and say, oh, that's not really a table. It's just a lump of molecules bound together by a strong and weak nuclear force. Um, but there's really nothing just about it. It's just that that's what you just use the word just, though, I would point out. Damn it. Um, <laughs> it's a fact about tables that that is how they are made up. And I do think that it is a fact about parental affection, that it stems from an evolutionary history. And there's probably things that people who are smarter than me know about the neurochemistry of it. And it can be fascinating to dive into those things. But it, it seems to me that it would be a mistake to say that you have diminished something simply by understanding its microstructure. Mm -hmm. And some people go in the opposite direction and say they're filled with awe and wonder by the fact that from this, you know, seemingly mechanistic and seemingly ruthless process of natural selection, you know, to just just superficially ruthless. I mean, from from that spring things like love. That's are you filled with awe and wonder even as I say that? 
Uh, you you phrased it in a more awe and wondery kind of way, um, and it's you know I mean it's interesting how I, I do think at least that sort of whole systems of of morality, including you know more high minded and impersonal types of types of ideas, do seem to spring out of these kind of basic mechanisms of care for your family and, and your kin and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, at least that's sort of my understanding of it, but it's, it's a, there's some fairly astounding feats of human cooperation uh, that we're able to pull off as sort of built out of these kind of little building blocks of, uh, I don't know, taking care of babies. Yeah, I think we're better than you might have predicted if you had just heard a bare bones description of the process of natural selection. Right. And, you know, I mean, certainly you look at these sort of, you know, small bands of chimpanzees or whatever, and it's, they're kind of cool. Um, and they can, you know, dig things out with sticks and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, hu human beings, homo sapiens have pulled off some, uh, some, some pretty astounding kind of things out of the kind of pretty basic toolkit that, mm -hmm. that we started out with. It's great. Thumbs up to humanity. I and, say. and offspring. Yes. You're, yes. In, favor, well, you're in favor of offspring. So, I think so, yeah. What would you have said before you got married and had your child if I had said what gives your life meaning? Um, I don't know. You know, it, in retrospect, life uh, life from my 20s seems like a, a meaningless series of, <laughs> of senseless encounters. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I definitely, I, I used to feel propelled forward by a lot of um, uh, petty grievances and uh, 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 I don't know what. But um, Well, what you'll find is that that magically changes once you become a, a parent and the grievances become about like things that your kids, peers and teachers do to them instead of things that people <laughs> do to you. It's really <laughs> much, much sense. better. That makes sense. I can develop sort of one step remove grievances. Right. That, it's, that. It feels more high minded because you're doing it on behalf of others. And we won't mention the fact that it's the same old genes. <laughs> that you're doing it for. Everything does feel more high-minded because you can say like, oh, I'm not being greedy. I'm actually just trying to make sure I can have like a really good stroller for right. the baby. You I'm know? being a good father. Right, this, exactly. This is not selfish. I'm, I'm right. a good father. <laughs> no, I mean, that is that is sort of the trick of it. I, I think I have like a, a better understanding of um, prestige cable drama uh, anti-heroes. Um, you know, that this is like Tony Soprano's rationalization to himself of everything that he's doing is that totally. he's a generous father to his kids. Mm -hmm. So that means, you know, he's actually a good person. And I mean, obviously that was... <clears throat> always in the text of the shows, uh, but mm -hmm. I think, I, I, think I, I understand that sort of Sopranos, Breaking Bad, what's, what's meant to be going on there a lot mm -hmm. better than I used to. Yeah, you have the makings of a great father. You're totally getting it. I like that. Sure. Ready to go. I'm cooking up meth. <laughs> so, so, uh, so one might infer from your perhaps somewhat facetious claim that your entire life was meaningless prior to having a child that now, when you go to work and do your work, you find no meaning in it. Because that's, after all, that's what you were doing before you had the child, and you now declare that meaningless. Yes. So would you care to revise your remarks or, or something? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a hollow shell of uh, existence. And um, no, I, I've actually been really excited over the past year and a half to have participated in the sort of starting of a, of a new website and a... Um, that's Vox, yes. The Vox, Vox. Vox com. Click, click, and share. Um, and and it's been uh, on one level, it's like I'm sort of been glad to like amp up my level of work stuff to to sort of raise the stakes to keep it sort of feeling real. Um, I do think that I, I really loved working at Slate, and that was a tremendous group of colleagues, and I um, really liked the the stories that I was writing there. But it is harder for me to be excited about continuing to do the sorts of things that I've been doing for a while. I mean, everything in life gets boring a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but, you know, children and the stress and the, and the hassle of that ha has a certain way of, like, deadening how other things feel. And it's been good in a lot of ways to be also involved in something that at least is, is very new to me and is, is sort of dynamic. By the way, I don't generally do plot spoilers, but the exhilaration will subside somewhat as the years advance. I am absolutely, I hope so. Yeah.
Yeah, and then I can start, I don't know what, web video schemes. Uh, yeah, that's actually that I don't recommend. I recommend Parenthood more highly than I recommend that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but, uh, so, but you still do actually get work from your meaning, presumably, right? Get meaning from my work. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get work from my meaning. <laughs> did I say work from your meaning? Yes, you did. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah, no, 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 I mean, I do. I mean, I, I, I have a... a, a a line of work that I like. Um, I have a lot of ability to sort of write about things that I'm interested in and that's really good. And I really like, I don't know how old timey print. I'm sure I can answer this question, but go ahead. But I, I do really like that I hear back from people constantly about stories that I wrote. Um, sometimes I roll my eyes and, you know, you, you hear a lot of annoying feedback, uh, but it's actually always really nice to hear that people have read what you've done and that they bother to give a damn about it. It's better when you hear nice things from them, but there's something reassuring about even uh, getting mean feedback. You know, it's like, it's good to know that someone cares. This is not, by and large, a conversation about journalism, but you raise an interesting point. And the answer, that I think somewhat significant and consequential answer to your question, is what it was like to be an old-fashioned print journalist before there were, like, you know, comment sections and sharing in the digital sense. Twitter, Twitter mentions. And all of that. Yeah. Is that much more of the feedback was, a sociologist would say, elite-mediated. It right. was like you heard from your peers, your colleagues. They heard things at cocktail parties consisting of peers and colleagues and so on. And I think that's actually had an influence. I mean, people complain about clickbait journalism. Right. Well, this is one, you know, you, you, you perhaps fortunately did not know what, you know, the grassroots response to your work was back then. And, and that may have led to, in some cases, uh, better journalism. I don't know. But I don't want to sound like an old cranky guy. And besides, this isn't about me. No, um, but I mean, I do think that I, I think that's true, though, and it, it is a I mean, on just the question of meaning, something that you do see journalistically in the social shares and whatever else is what kinds of subjects have meaning to what kinds of people out there? You know, what what do they care about? Um, and it is true that it is often not the same as what do the people who I um, socialize with personally care about. Um, you know, I know, I, I, all of us know an idiosyncratic group of people. Um, and that's good. It's, it's nice in life to have communities that you participate in and that are to some extent like-minded and, and share certain kinds of interests. And then it's fascinating to see different ways of interacting with kind of like the broader world and what do people know? What do people care about there? Um, but sometimes it's really jarring. Yeah. No, I like it by and large. I mean, the feedback can be very gratifying, and, and you know, you get it in lots of ways, and I'm uh, very happy with, with the modern world. So, but back to you. Yeah. So, so and this whole meaning thing. You're yeah. not, like, religious, right? You weren't brought up religiously in the conventional sense? Uh, we, we had a, a, a mild amount of, of Jewish holiday observance in my upbringing. So observance as opposed to theistic belief. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, and I, I don't know, I don't want to speak for, for all people, but at, no, least, go ahead. Go at ahead. least Judaism strikes me as relatively comfortable with a certain amount of uh, empty formalism as an acceptable form of religious practice. Uh, I don't think I ever recall hearing my, my rabbi growing up really exhorting people to feel like a personal spiritual connection with God. It was that you were supposed to learn how to do certain chants and do the right observances at, at the right time. Um, at any rate, you know, we did, we did some of that, um, uh, my household growing up. Um, uh, I don't really do that now. Uh, my, my wife is not religious. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm in, sort of in a spiritual void. Spiritual as well as religious. That was going to be the next question. Are you spiritual but not religious if you're not religious? But apparently you're none of the above. I'm, I'm closer to being religious than to being spiritual. Oh, that's interesting. A rare thing to say, but it follows from what you just said about empty formalism, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what about, well, let's, ascending down the scale of spiritual involvement, let's ask if you're a moral realist. You're one of the few people who would know what I mean by that, probably, because you, didn't you major in philosophy in... Uh... I did, I did, and I, 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 I know. Um, Basically means, do you believe that there is moral truth, right? 
Yes. Um, you know, I mean, this is a complicated question, but I think that, um, that I am, that it makes about as much sense to talk about ethical propositions as being true or false as it does any other kind of abstraction. Um, and that there is a, um, yeah. So you believe in moral truth. How I, do you know what it is? What? How do you know what it is? Well, it's difficult to know, but how do you know what anything is? Well, I mean, like this table, that's easy. It's a table. It. We said it is. <laughs> no, but I mean, so, you know, I, I think that people could get a little, um, um, how do you say, uh, extreme about this, that like, how do I really know that there's a table here? I mean, you could advance a sort of radical skepticism about tables, make the question seem really hard, but you would be just sort of trying to show off there. The fact of the matter is that, you know, everyone agrees that there's a table here. There's no real controversy there. Um, is it okay to torture innocent children for fun? I, I don't think it is. I bet you don't think it is. I think there's a strong consensus about that. How do we really know that that's true? You know, I don't know any more than how do we really know it's true that there are tables, but it, it seems right. There doesn't seem to be a serious arguments against it. Um, I think you can, you know, uh, was it, Blackburn, I think, calls that a quasi-realist view of morality, uh, which may be a good term for it. Um, but I don't think there's any more justification for being a radical skeptic mm -hmm. about ethics than there is for being a radical skeptic about science or anything else. Okay. Have you thought about what kind of ethical guidance you'll give your child? Whether you'll, you'll, you'll give, Is it him or her? Him. 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 What, what's his name? Jose. Jose. I like that. It goes well yeah. with your last name. It's named after my grandfather. I see. Jose yeah. Iglesias. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so are, have you thought much about whether you're going to give him explicit ethical guidance, abstract ethical guidance, as opposed to saying you shouldn't have hit her and you shouldn't have done that? Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't actually thought too much about that. We're trying to see right now if we can get him to eat uh, little mushed up vegetables. Um, <laughs> well, but I think I think it follows from Kant's categorical imperative that he should. Yeah, you can explain you know, that to him. Uh, no, you know, but I, I do think that the sort of baseline ethical guidance that you should um, try to treat people how you would want to be treated if you were in their situation, that you should think about that seriously. I think that's a sort of a, a slogan that we find derived uh, from a lot of different sorts of background principles and that it, um, you know, does a lot of good, sort of good work as a way to think about things. Mm -hmm. Golden rule, so to speak. Yeah, I've heard of that. Okay. Yeah. It's around. It, it's, yeah. So, um, now not to keep harping on your work, but is there, I mean, is there a kind of uh, work that gives you more gratification than another kind of work in, in, some, in some sort of meaning of life he sense? I mean, like when you imagine at the end of your life, you look back on your work, if you and wishing you had done. By the way, are you wearing an Apple Watch? I am. Oh my God, I'm impressed. Yeah, journalism pays better than it used to, I guess. Sure, it's it's super. It's, is is that the one with the like thirty five thousand dollar band? No, it has the uh, band that comes with the watch. Oh, I see. Yeah, the the included band. Um, it's it hasn't become that lucrative. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, obviously, uh, when 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 I'm doing at least in in my line of work. Um, there's certain things where if you put in the time and the effort, you can optimize the keywords just right. And, you know, right. you get a good chunk of web search traffic to an article whose substance is fine, but not necessarily different from what people would have found if it hadn't existed at all. And it is certainly, um, sometimes important for a company's business objectives to put in the time to get that done, uh, but it is not in any way as personally gratifying or meaningful as when you get to feel like you're making a, a unique contribution to the world, putting forward ideas that aren't existing elsewhere, um, working with people who are doing original reporting or original arguments uh, about things that matter is... Um, you know, I think like why we all got interested in journalism and mm -hmm. it's ultimately, uh, I think creating sustainable business models is like a, a good thing in life. Uh, but the reason it's important to do that is to do, you know, original work that, okay. so to speak, has meaning.
So meaningful work involves a distinctive contribution. Yeah, I mean, I think you you uh, hope to say, I hope to say that, you know, some days, some weeks, some months, uh, I'm involved in producing things such that if they didn't exist, there wouldn't be just some obvious substitute. Mm. So this is what legacy is. It's kind of a definition of legacy, right? Looking back and saying, well, the world would be different uh, had I not lived and arguably would not be as good a place. Yes. That's what you strive for. That's it. Boom. And you know the sermon that I that I am, am tempted to give you on this, if you really want to have the most distinctive and productive impact possible, you know where I would steer your focus. I don't. You don't? No. Sure you do. Oh. You should do more for, foreign policy writing. Oh, okay. I'll be back. Did you come here for that kind of guidance? Yes. To this I, conversation? I, that's why I seek, seek you out. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad to see this uh, this nuclear deal, the Iran nuclear deal. Yes, I wouldn't. I'll tell you, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't celebrate yet. These these uh, the opposition is uh, relentless. It is well, and you know, and I do think, and I mean to write this uh, in the near future, and should, as you say, uh, but that I do think that one um, distressing possible consequence here is that. Uh, Israel and its allies on Capitol Hill by raising so much fuss and kicking and screaming, even if they're not able to win the day on the particular issue of this nuclear point, are are going to find themselves cashing in so many chips, Mm -hmm. you know, on on other matters in a way that's really sort of uh, destructive. Um, And, you know, I think we heard Hillary Clinton the other day sort of like promising that well, you know, this is not the beginning of a new relationship between the U.S. and Iran. Right. Which, you know, I, I think that's probably what I would tell her to say on the campaign trail, but it's not a great idea. Um, you know, we shouldn't have, well, I don't know. I think we'd probably see eye to eye on this. Um, but You should write this piece, as we yeah, used to say in journalism. I need you to, should write I need this to, piece. I need to actually do this work instead of talking to you about the meaning of life. Yeah, not that this conversation doesn't have its own distinctive virtues, but you're so productive. And this is one thing. Can you this is this is distantly meaning of life ish, I guess. Um, yeah. How are you so productive? You're phenomenally productive. What do you think is the difference between you and other people? I, you know, I don't really know. Um, but I think that there is a definitely a, a sort of a family uh, legacy in this. My, my father is a novelist and a screenwriter and he's working on a television show now. Um, Aquarius on NBC. Check it out. Um, and a lot of writers in my family. And uh, my, my grandfather, um, Jose, was a, a playwright. Uh, my, my grandmother was a journalist. Um, and most of them, at least as I understand it, had the reputation of being fast writers. Um, in their day, uh, mediums change over time. And obviously with web publishing, it's possible to actually like hit send on a lot of articles mm-hmm. in a way that wasn't necessarily the case uh, when my grandfather was doing pieces for New York Times Magazine and, and stuff like that. Um, but so I don't actually know in a sort of a micro sense why some people write faster than others. Um, but on a macro level, I think there's a writing fast gene. D- does it mean you are not overly concerned with what people think about the writing? I mean, that's one common source of not producing a lot of writing is a lot of fretting about what you'll say that will be acceptable. Yeah, I mean, some people are maybe too self-conscious about uh, different kinds of things or or they're appropriately self-conscious. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, in my experience, a lot of people who are quite free with and sort of compelling, if you just talk to them and you ask them what they think about things, when you ask them, well, would you put that thought in writing so people could see it? you know, at their leisure, um, become very hesitant. And I don't totally know why that is. Um, I believe, you know, you should be able to, if pe- people are able to say what they think, they should be able to write what they think. Yeah. Well, this but I know it doesn't work like that. I mean, I, I know people who have become very dedicated podcasters and, you know, who appear on multiple sorts of different regular shows, uh, but who find it excruciating to write in any kind of volume. Well, I kind of feel that way myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just yeah. easier to have a conversation than to sit down and try to structure a coherent argument. Yeah, see, I almost feel the opposite. I kind of hate talking to people. 
that's very uh well then i'm all the more grateful that you've chosen to <laughs> and i'm all the more flattered honored and so on well i mean even this though it's like it's very mediated i i, I just think um like i i love to tweet uh you know blog is great a, a little video chat is okay um, i find actual like conversations with strangers in particular terrify me and i'm much more comfortable hmm. publishing hmm Maybe this explains it. Okay. So before we go, we must discuss your impending death. Yes. Um, does it bother you? Does it bother my that You'll die someday. Um, it seems regrettable. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm open to the idea that, you know, if you really left, lived forever, that that would be tedious or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear people say that. And it, it makes a certain amount of sense to me, but, like, I certainly really don't want to die. Yeah. That's your, and that's your final word on the subject. I would, I would like to stave it off. I think mm -hmm. um, I enjoy being alive, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing, we're saying, like, leaving a legacy seems like a good idea. Right. Um, the longer you're alive the more opportunity you have to try to do that. Um, I also feel, you know, I'm 34 now, and I already feel like a lot of stuff I did previously was really dumb, um, that I'm, like, smarter now. Does anything I, in particular come to mind? No, it's just, like, everything, you know? I, like, I know the feeling, but yours was less dumb than, than most, I would say. Um, <laughs> no, but it's, like, I don't... I, I, I definitely feel, you know, like, physically, like, my best days are probably behind me. Like, my, like, crazy... No, if you were a mathematician, that would be true. And, and we're... No, no, I mean, I'm saying, like, like, like aspects of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of my life are like that, but that in a lot of ways, I still feel like, at least, like, I get smarter and wiser about things, and that... Um, that, that is, these Maybe. are the two, the two curves whose relationship defines something or other. Sheer analytical sharpness, which has probably already started to decline even in your case. So that's why mathematicians yeah. fade out early. But then there is the accumulation of knowledge and wisdom. And what we hope, you and I both, is that Google-related technologies will not become so sophisticated and subtle that even that advantage, the, the advantage of knowledge, will begin to erode uh, right. Well, who knows? I mean, you know, I, I, as I say, you know, there's maybe some point where I might start to feel like, eh, you know, I've had enough of this. Um, but for now, at least, it seems like, you know, the longer people stick around, they do pick up some some real knowledge yeah. and, and wisdom. And it's a it's a shame that that gets lost when people die. Well, you still have some time left, I think, because I know I was talking to, you know, the historian William McNeil. Yes. I was talking to him on the phone, maybe the first conversation I ever had with him. And at some point, this was years and years ago, he said, how old are you? And I said, I don't know, I was like 42, I guess. And he said, you are at the height of your powers. <laughs> so, so you have eight years left, and that's good. That's good. I'll, I'll try to think, come up with something good. All right. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time, that's Matt it. Iglesias. Absolutely. And uh, I'll let you I'll let you get back to boxing and uh, we'll we'll check in um, down the line at some point. Sounds good. OK. Take All care. right.